It is common knowledge, at least within the confines of mainstream thought, that the Great Pyramid of Giza is a tomb, the final resting place of the 26th century BCE Egyptian pharaoh Khufu. There's just one problem with this assumption. Inside the Great Pyramid, no mummies have ever been found, nor any of the other trappings commonly contained within tombs elsewhere across Egypt, like artifacts, valuable jewelry, or opulent art. None of the household items it was believed pharaohs would need in the afterlife. Many have asked, how can the Great Pyramid of Giza be assumed to be a tomb when it lacks the characteristics which define other tombs? Accordingly, there are many who believe that it is not a tomb at all, but rather an ancient electric power plant. Although it may sound impossible, plenty of evidence suggests that the idea might not be as crazy as it seems. Consider, for one, the Great Pyramid's construction. Originally, it was covered by an outer layer of white tufa limestone blocks, which fit together so perfectly, not even a razor blade could slip between them. White tufa limestone is unique for its excellent insulating properties. Beneath these insulating blocks, the Great Pyramid's passages and tunnels are lined with granite, a well-known electrical conductor. This is particularly strange since granite is not found in the area, meaning the 8,000 tons used in the pyramid had to be shipped to Giza from over 500 miles away, quite an undertaking if it did not serve some specific purpose. In addition, the Great Pyramid was historically topped by a capstone of gold, one of the most electrically conductive materials on Earth. It's not just conjecture. In 2018, a scientific study published in the Journal of Applied Physics revealed that the Great Pyramid could, in fact, concentrate electromagnetic energy in its internal chambers as well as under its base. It seems as though the Great Pyramid of Giza was perfectly constructed to funnel electricity through its chambers to its gold peak and out into the world. Of course, if this is true, it raises more questions than answers. First and foremost, what electricity? According to the mainstream historical record, electrical science did not emerge as a field of study until thousands of years after the Golden Age of Egypt. How can one say the Great Pyramid was an electric power plant if Egypt didn't even have electricity? To answer this question, one might look into the bowels of the Great Pyramid to its historic king's chamber. There, rather than the pharaoh's mummy and treasures, only one simple object was found, a large granite coffer with nothing in it. Curiously, the volume of the coffer's empty space is the exact size of one of history's most legendary and most mysterious artifacts. To answer the question of an electric Egypt, one must start with the Ark of the Covenant. Before we continue, we want to thank ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. When you use the bathroom, you always close the door behind you, right? You don't want random passers-by looking in on you. So why would you let people look in on you when you go online? Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like going to the bathroom and not closing the door. Your internet service provider knows every single website you visit. And what's worse is in the U.S., internet providers are legally allowed to sell this information to ad companies and tech giants. ExpressVPN puts a stop to this. It reroutes your network data through a secure, encrypted server before it goes to the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. I use ExpressVPN on all my devices, phones, laptops, even routers, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can still be protected even if they don't have ExpressVPN. So if you're like me and believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com forward slash universe inside you today. Use my link and you can get an extra three months free. According to the Hebrew Bible, after leading the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses ascended to the top of Mount Sinai to meet with God. There he was said to have received the Ten Commandments, those rules which would form the base for the actions of his people forevermore. But this was not the only thing Moses received on the mountain. He was also given detailed instructions on how to construct an object which would become synonymous with the Jewish faith, the Ark of the Covenant. As recorded in Exodus chapter 25, God said to Moses, They shall make an ark of acacia wood. 
It shall be two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. You shall overlay it with pure gold, inside and outside you shall overlay it. And you shall make a molding of gold upon it all around. Then you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, and a cubit and a half its width. You shall make two cherubim of gold. You shall make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. They shall face one to another. The faces of the cherubim shall be turned toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the covenant, I will deliver to you all my commands for the Israelites. It is interesting to note that Judaism largely rejects idolatry, that is, physical manifestations of spirituality. In fact, when Moses came down from the mountain to find the Israelites worshipping a golden calf in his absence, he smashed the tablets on which the Ten Commandments were written in rage. This makes it very curious that God himself would give such detailed instructions on how to create, in effect, an idol. Of course, the ark was not just any idol. It was not permitted to be touched or even looked at, the opposite of most idols, which are designed to be seen and worshipped. When it was moved, the ark was covered with cloth and skins, held up by poles so that it would not touch the ground. Even the high priest was not permitted to be in the presence of the ark when it was uncovered, except to perform very specific and very rare rituals. More importantly, however, were the great powers the ark was said to possess. Many are familiar with the story of Moses parting the Red Sea in order to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and into the desert. Less well known, however, is that a similar story appeared at the end of this period, when the Israelites were leaving the desert and finally crossing into the Promised Land. Upon reaching the Jordan River, which separated the Israelites from the land of Jericho, priests waded into the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant. As their feet touched the water, the river suddenly ceased to flow, as though it had been dammed upstream. Once the Israelites had crossed, the priests with the ark finished crossing, at which point the river resumed flowing normally. Like with the story of Moses parting the Red Sea, historians and scientists have for millennia tried to determine how this could have been possible. However, the ark's power went much further than this. According to ancient Jewish texts, during their years wandering in the desert, the ark would travel slightly ahead of the Israelites. As it did, it would clear the way for those behind, purportedly by shooting some sort of energy from between the two cherubim on its lid, which would incinerate snakes, scorpions, thorn bushes, and other dangers. It was not just vermin who felt the Ark's wrath. Across the ancient texts are many stories of those thrown back, injured, maimed, even killed when they touched the Ark. For example, once the Israelite kingdom of King David had been established, the Ark of the Covenant was transported to the new capital of Jerusalem. On its way, one of the oxen pulling the cart on which the Ark rested stumbled, throwing the cart off balance and threatening to send the Ark tumbling to the ground. One in the party, a man named Uzzah, reached out his hand to steady it and was instantly killed, as recorded in Samuel chapter 6. When they came to the threshing floor of Nikon, Uzzah reached out his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him there because he reached out his hand to the Ark, and he died there beside the Ark of God. Nobody was immune. Leviticus chapter 10 describes the gruesome death of Nadab and Abihu, the grandsons of Moses. In the presence of the uncovered Ark, the two lit incense to offer to God when suddenly a fire came forth from the Lord and consumed them. Even the high priest would have a rope tied around his waist before he entered the chamber containing the uncovered ark, in case he was suddenly struck dead, so he could be pulled out without someone else having to retrieve him and risk death themselves. Throughout their history, the Israelites would bring this terrifying contraption with them to war, whether for inspiration or otherwise. 
In one infamous instance, the ark was carried around the walls of the sieged city of Jericho for seven days, while the Israelites blew horns. On the seventh day, the city walls suddenly, miraculously, crumbled. Later, when the Israelites were losing a war to the Philistines, they decided to bring the ark with them into battle. To their dismay, this did not turn the tide. They were defeated and the ark was captured, taken by the Philistines to their own country as a prize and set up in the temple of their god Dagon. Yet, once it was there, a series of unfortunate events befell the Philistines. First, they found the giant idol of Dagon toppled, laying face down in front of the ark as though bowing. They put it back, but the next day it was toppled again, this time smashed to pieces. Shortly thereafter, the city was hit by plague, civilians beset with tumors, and their fields overrun with mice. The Philistines tried moving the ark to other cities, but each time a terrible plague struck the population. Finally, not knowing what to do, they simply sent the ark back to the Israelites, unable to deal with its mysterious power. They even sent gold-cast tumors and mice along with it, mementos of their terrible experience. Throughout the stories told in the Hebrew Bible and other ancient Jewish texts, the powerful and mysterious Ark of the Covenant plays a prominent role for a period of some 500 years, from the time of Moses to King David and King Solomon to the time of the divided kingdom. And then, suddenly, nothing. Mention of the Ark completely disappears from the record. So, what happened? How could such an important object be lost, or worse still, forgotten? Was it destroyed, or just hidden away? And if it was hidden away, where is it now? According to an ancient Ethiopian text known as Kibra Negast, the Queen of Sheba, what is now Ethiopia, traveled to visit the Israelite King Solomon sometime around 950 BCE. There she would become pregnant with Solomon's child, a boy whom she would name Menelik. This boy would go on to be king in Ethiopia, founding a dynasty which would incredibly last until 1974. As an adult, Menelik would return to Jerusalem to visit his father. On his journey home, Menelik was accompanied by several Israelite nobles who, unbeknownst to him, had stolen the Ark of the Covenant from their king and replaced it with a fake. Having made it all the way back home before he found out, Menelik determined it must have been the will of God that resulted in the Ark coming into his possession, and so he decided to keep it in Ethiopia. And there it has remained for the past 3,000 years, according to the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion in Akram, Ethiopia, guarded by virgin monks who devote their lives to its protection, not permitted to ever leave the building where the Ark is kept once they are entrusted with the task. Could this really be true? Could the once all-powerful Ark really be sitting in some nondescript building in East Africa? Perhaps, but perhaps not. The Kibra Negast is not the only story of the Ark's fate. Some believe that when the Babylonians invaded the Israelite kingdom in the 6th century BCE, the prophet Jeremiah secretly snuck the Ark out beforehand and hid it on the top of a mountain in what is now Jordan, where it remains to this day. Others believe that the Ark, like the biblical Holy Grail, was discovered by the Knights Templar during the Crusades and that it was taken back to Europe and hidden in the Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland. Others still claim the Ark is buried under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, waiting to be uncovered. This could explain the many strange UFO sightings right above Jerusalem. The most mysterious of them was when one night, a bright ball of light came over the Temple Mounts and just hovered there, when all of a sudden, a pulsing light went out of it and the strange UFO disappeared. The true location of the Ark is something which many have tried to uncover throughout history. Perhaps this should be no surprise, given the Ark's purported power. In the 1981 film, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, the titular character, Indiana Jones, rushes to find the Ark of the Covenant before it can be discovered by the Germans, who would use its immense power for their own terrible ends. Yes, it's only a movie, of course, except the basis of the plot is actually kind of accurate. 
It is well known that the Germans were obsessed with the occult and with mysterious ancient artifacts. Records show that Heinrich Himmler, head of the SS and second most powerful man in the Third Reich, traveled into the Montserrat Mountains in 1940, searching for the biblical Holy Grail, and believed that the mythical Thor's hammer was, in his own words, an early highly developed war weapon of our forefathers. Hitler himself was said to be searching for the weapon that pierced Jesus' side on the cross during crucifixion, while some suggest that the Germans were using spy balloons to search for Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, where it allegedly ended up after the Great Flood. The point is, the suggestion that the Nazis were pursuing the Ark of the Covenant so that they might use its mythical power for their own ends is not as far-fetched as it might sound. But this leads to the critical question. What powers did the Ark actually have? Are the stories true? Was it really some sort of super weapon? Or maybe it was even something more. In 1745, a Dutch scientist named Peter von Musenbroek brought forward an invention that would change the course of electrical science. It was called a Leyden jar, named after van Musenbroek's hometown of Leiden. Simply, a Leyden jar was a sort of capacitor a device for collecting and storing electricity. For von Musenbroek, it was constructed by coating a glass jar with conducting metal foil on both the inside and the outside. From the mouth of the jar, a metal rod affixed to the inner foil would protrude, collecting the atmospheric charge. Both the inner and outer foil surfaces would collect and store equal but opposite charges, the glass insulating one conductor and its charge from the other. Think of the well-known story of Benjamin Franklin flying a kite in a thunderstorm in order to experiment with lightning and electricity. At the end of the kite string, a Leyden jar, which Franklin called Musenbrook's wonderful bottle. Shortly after the Leyden jar was invented, a revolutionary idea was put forward by Georg Wilhelm Lichtenberg, one of the fathers of electrical science. He believed that the biblical Ark of the Covenant was, in fact, an ancient Leyden jar. The idea gained mainstream recognition and articles appeared all over the world calling the Ark a very expensive but very perfect Leyden jar. Think about it. The Ark was a wood box coated on both the inside and the outside by gold, much as the glass Leyden jar is coated with metal foil, with gold of course being much more conductive than foil. One might surmise that the inner layer of gold collected a positive charge and the outer layer a negative one with each cherubim topper connected to one layer, making the shell of the Ark a charged capacitor. As one journalist put it, if the Israelites had set out to construct a primitive accumulator, they could hardly have picked a better design than the Ark. Crucially, as a Leyden jar gains electrical charge, a heavy difference in voltage is built between the two conductors, which can be released as a powerful spark if the device is touched. During his experiments, Van Musenbroek himself experienced this phenomenon, noting that from one such shock, my whole body was shaken as though by a thunderbolt. Similarly, Benjamin Franklin was knocked unconscious for several hours while experimenting with a small Leyden jar the size of a pint glass. This might immediately call to mind the fate of those who touched the Ark of the Covenant. Rather than shocked by a small jar, they were killed even incinerated by the much larger, much more conductive Ark. How much more powerful than a normal Leyden jar might the Ark have been? In 1961, a group of college students from the University of Minnesota tried to recreate the Ark exactly, but had to stop the project and destroy their work because of the uncontrollably large electric charge it developed. Could the Ark of the Covenant really have been a sort of supercharged Leyden jar? a capacitor designed to store and exert electricity? If so, the question might become, how could Moses have known about such a thing? He lived thousands of years before the Leyden jar was invented, thousands of years even before electrical science became a field of study. So how could the Ark of the Covenant have been a Leyden jar? Long before he led the exodus of the Israelites, Moses was a member of Egyptian royalty. At the time Moses was born, Pharaoh Ramses II was seeking to subvert the growing Hebrew population in Egypt, and thus he ordered all male Hebrew babies killed. 
In order to spare Moses from the slaughter, his Hebrew mother and sister placed him in a basket and floated him down the Nile River to the spot where the Pharaoh's daughter and her attendants came to bathe. When she discovered the baby Moses, the Pharaoh's daughter decided to raise him as her own child. This meant that for the first 40 years of his life, Moses lived as a prince of Egypt, receiving the best Egyptian education and eventually becoming one of the Pharaoh's closest advisors. As recorded in the book of Acts chapter 7, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. The question is, just what did this wisdom entail? What knowledge would Moses have been privy to? What secrets reserved for only the highest level Egyptians? In our videos about hidden entrances beneath the Great Pyramid and the Great Sphinx, we mentioned the written accounts of 4th century Syrian philosopher Iamblichus, who wrote, We came to a chamber. When we entered, it became automatically illuminated by light from a tube, being the height of one man's hand and thin, standing vertically in the corner. As we approached the tube, it shone brighter. The slaves were scared and ran away in the direction from which we had come. When I touched it, it went out. We made every effort to get the tube to glow again, but it would no longer provide light. Note that in many places, ancient Egyptian carvings and art appeared to depict the use of light bulbs, seeming to confirm the observations of Iamblichus. Strange as it may sound, this seems to suggest that ancient Egypt was electrically powered. Perhaps then the Ark of the Covenant, if it was some sort of electrical capacitor like a Leyden jar, was a replica of something Moses had seen or heard about in Egypt. But what? In the late 1800s, a British inventor named Sir William Siemens climbed with a team to the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Once at the summit, one of his guides casually remarked that he was experiencing a shrill ringing in his ears when he raised his hand with fingers spread. Curious, Siemens raised his own hand and immediately felt a strange prickling sensation running through his body. Moments later, Siemens went to take a sip of wine from a bottle he'd brought to celebrate the successful climb. But when he touched the bottle to his lips, he received a painful electric shock. Surely, Siemens thought, this could not be a coincidence. Quickly, he constructed a sort of makeshift Leyden jar with his wine bottle by coating it in wet newspaper. Astonishingly, when he raised the makeshift jar above his head, sparks began to shoot out of the top and fly through the air. This frightened his guide, who suddenly rushed at Siemens in an attempt to grab the bottle out of his hands. In the heat of the moment, the bottle got pointed at the guide, knocking him clean off his feet and onto his back, unconscious. One might ask, if such a hastily made, poorly constructed Leyden jar had that kind of effect when introduced at the top of the Great Pyramid, what would happen if one which was much larger and made of much higher quality materials, such as the Ark of the Covenant, was placed in the pyramid at exactly the right spot? Recall that deep in the heart of the Great Pyramid is a so-called King's Chamber. Within this chamber was found just one thing a stone coffer with an empty space exactly the size of the Ark of the Covenant. What would happen if the Ark was placed exactly in this spot? Some believe the answer has already been found. Extending through the bowels of the Great Pyramid are two small and mysterious tunnels, approximately 8 inches by 8 inches large. In 1993, a team of researchers sent a small robot up one of these tunnels where it encountered a stone door with what appeared to be a metal handle on it. This was very strange, since metal is not found anywhere else in the pyramid. In 2002, another team used a robot to drill through this door, only to find a small chamber behind it, blocked by a large backing stone. What could this chamber contain, many wondered. Finally, in 2011, a team revisited this chamber using a micro-snake camera to avoid obstructions. What the camera photographed was stunning. Red hieroglyphs painted everywhere, curious symbols and diagrams. There are some who believe that these hieroglyphs are in fact ancient wiring diagrams. 
explaining in detail how to use the Great Pyramid as an electric power generator. Is this possible? Could the Ark of the Covenant really have been a powerful capacitor at the heart of an advanced electrical system? It is worth noting that the instructions Moses allegedly received from God at the top of Mount Sinai did not just detail how to construct the Ark of the Covenant, but also how to construct the tabernacle in which it would be housed. Look to Moses' brother Aaron, who after Moses' death, built up the tabernacle surrounding the ark with 150-foot gold poles with gold chains hanging from them. Was this an effort to replicate the conductivity of the Great Pyramid system using the secret knowledge Moses took from his time as an Egyptian prince? Then again, maybe it was not just knowledge that Moses took from the Egyptians. According to biblical record, when Moses freed the Israelites from Egypt, they were encouraged to steal as much Egyptian treasure as they could carry. Perhaps they did not just take precious metals or jewels, but the very thing which made Egypt great, the supercapacitor at the heart of their electrical power plant, the Ark of the Covenant. Would this not explain why the Pharaoh pursued the Israelites so ruthlessly? Interestingly, History records that only a few years after the exodus of the Israelites, the mighty Egyptian civilization began to crumble, never again reaching its previous heights. Could this be because they lost their source of electricity? Is it possible that the secret of the power of the Ark of the Covenant, of the biblical story of Moses, and historical records of an Egyptian golden age, is the secret of ancient electricity? At least one of history's greatest thinkers believes so. In 1915, famed inventor and indisputable genius Nikola Tesla published an article entitled The Wonder World to be Created by Electricity. In it, he stated the following, Moses was undoubtedly a practical and skillful electrician far in advance of his time. The Bible describes precisely and minutely arrangements constituting a machine in which electricity was generated. It wasn't just Moses. Tesla was infatuated with ancient Egypt, and specifically the pyramids, studying these things profoundly and incorporating the knowledge gained into his work. In 1905, ten years before he was publicly proclaiming that Moses was a skilled electrician, Tesla filed a patent titled Art of Transmitting Electrical Energy Through the Natural Medium, in which he introduced a design for something called Tesla's Electromagnetic Pyramid. His idea was to pump the planet with electricity using a pyramid-like structure to project energy skyward, where it could then be harnessed by individual receptors around the world. In short, his idea was to use a pyramid as an electric power plant to generate unlimited free energy for the world. Is it possible that in his Electromagnetic Pyramid, Tesla was simply trying to recreate the function of the Great Pyramid of Giza with the Ark of the Covenant at its core? Think about the many obelisks which were prominent in the architecture of ancient Egypt with their granite body and quartz top, both of which possess high electrical conductivity. They could certainly have served as the energy receptors Tesla envisioned, tapping into the energy conduit produced by the Great Pyramid. It must be noted for Tesla these ideas were not just hypothetical. He constructed the massive Wardenclyffe Tower in Shoreham, New York, in the early 1900s based on his design, and even had some success projecting energy skyward. When just it seemed that Tesla was about to reach his theorized breakthrough in unlimited free energy, the funding to his project was cut, and Tesla was forced to shut the whole thing down. Interestingly, his financial backer had been J.P. Morgan, the American tycoon who had, incidentally, gotten rich financing the giants of oil and industry, that is, precisely those whose empires would be threatened by a new unlimited free energy source. If this was, in fact, the reason that Tesla's electromagnetic pyramid project was shut down due to the threat it posed to the existing global power structure, then it might be asked if information about an electrical Egypt and the true purpose of the Ark of the Covenant has been suppressed for exactly the same reason. 
There is one final question that might be asked before leaving. Free unlimited energy is a pretty big secret to keep. If knowledge of this is being suppressed, what other secrets of ancient Egypt might be hidden? For example, how is it possible that the Great Pyramid was built at the exact center of the landmass on Earth when, thousands of years ago, the Egyptians could not have been aware of this position? How was it that the Great Pyramid, along with the Sphinx, were laid out to align perfectly with the orientation of the stars? And how is it possible that complex mathematical equations and concepts like pi were used in the engineering of the Great Pyramid when they would not officially be discovered until many years later? Also, why do so many ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs and carvings appear to depict UFOs? This strange lost part of our history continues to be shrouded in mystery. And until we get an answer to all of these questions, we must keep an open mind and remember that most often, time reveals that truth is stranger than fiction. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. And if you're new, hit subscribe and the bell next to it for future notifications.